So, does it work? Yes, it works. Always the exciting part of the start, right? So hiring velocity is business velocity. This is the connection I would like to make in the next 20 minutes. And more specifically on why is this so important? Because I think that we as recruitment specialists have a tremendous impact on if we deliver talent on time, on how fast our organizations can grow and develop. So hi, I'm Tony, Tony de Graaf, really Dutch last name. I live in Berlin, uh, where I work for Smart Recruiters as the Hiring Success Director in EMEA. And yes, we are a talent acquisition suite, an APTS, applicant tracking system, whatever you want to call it, but I'm a strategy consultant. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do. My background is I uh, have a classic recruiter career, started on agency side, then moved to the corporate side, headed up recruitment for multiple fashion brands and also for one of the biggest e-commerce companies in the Netherlands. And then almost two and a half years ago, I joined Smart Recruiters for my first non-recruiting job in my life. And now I get to consult recruiting teams around the world and help them improve. So, and this actually gives me the possibility to take a look in the kitchen of talent acquisition at beautiful brands like H&M, McDonald's, Continental, all the way to Universal Studios and the Shopify's of this world. So I am very excited about my job every day. I wanna break this talk down into three pieces. I wanna start with why. Why should we care so much about that connection between hiring velocity and business velocity? And how, if we have get that out of the way, how can we actually build a talent acquisition function that always delivers what the business needs. And third, I wanna end with an example on how I started doing this in my previous role. So let's start with the why. Let's start with a market example. The chip shortage and the effect on car manufacturers. We all know Toyota, largest car manufacturer in the world. And in Q3 and in Q4, they had to reduce their production capacity globally by 40% and 30% just because of the chip shortage. And you may think, so what, we're recruiters, what does that have to do with us? Well, in this example, you see that the shortage of a resource has a tremendous effect on the maximum business velocity these organizations can achieve. And if we take a look at a different type of resource, people, the same is true, right? We all know if we can't hire enough salespeople or not enough software engineers, we are at risk at slowing down our entire organization. So our ability to deliver talent exactly on time when the business needs it, is closely connected to the business velocity of our organizations. And what do we call this ability to deliver talent exactly on time? That's your hiring velocity. So your hiring velocity is closely connected to your business velocity. Right? And yes, you may think, as long as your hiring velocity is equal or greater than your business velocity, no problem, you are delivering, right? But we cannot really fill a warehouse with all hired people waiting to go. So the moment our hiring velocity drops below our business velocity, we are at risk at slowing down our entire organization. And we see these examples all around us. If you Google on anything that has to do with news and labor market in almost all European countries and in the United States, you see headlines like this, because there is a shortage, right? So the first example is from Romania, the second from the UK, and the third one from Hungary. But it, it is all over, the, all over the world roughly the same. Right? And it's not just that it is a branch issue or a specific type of talent. No, it's an industry challenge. Because if you look at the number of open jobs, this is from the UK, for example, it's an all-time record-breaking 1.3 million open roles. But again, if you look at almost all European and American comp uh, US state uh, countries, the graphs look the same. Because this one is for the United States. Well, record-breaking 11 million open jobs. And how do we as TA leaders actually deal with this peak demand? Right? And the problem is, if we haven't consistently invested over the last couple of years to continuously improve our TA capabilities, like for example, really deep investing in CRM, building a vibrant talent community around our organization the last couple of years, so we are not so affected by whatever is happening in the market, we can only do one thing. The demand goes up, we need to work harder. We need to run faster. We need to hire more recruiters. And that is exactly what we're doing. Because the demand for recruiters is absolutely through the roof. And to put this graph into perspective, Kate Riley did a research on LinkedIn and she took all the recruiter jobs and all the software engineer roles. And this summer, something happened for the first time, just before that peak actually set a new record. There were more recruiter roles open on LinkedIn than software engineer roles open on LinkedIn. Let that sink in for a moment. 
And that article wasn't just about the analysis because what uh, the title of the article was, is actually from what other industries can we hire people into recruitment? Because that's the situation that we're at, right? So hiring philosophy is closely connected to our business philosophy. And I hope it shows that if we wait until we actually become that bottleneck, it is very hard to solve that on the spot because the only thing we can do at that very moment is work harder and run faster, but that's not really a long time solution, is it? So why is it actually so, uh, oh, there was one more thing I actually wanted to add here, right? So what do we actually need to do? I think that we as talent acquisition people, we're always so focused on filling the open jobs, right? But we have another responsibility. We also need to become responsible for continuously improving our TA capabilities. I would even argue it is 50-50 as the responsibility in your role. That's where we need to go. But why is that so hard for us to move away from uh, just the focus on uh, filling the open jobs to becoming more strategic about it? And I really like this image. You never should take yourself too serious in life for one, but two, it actually shows the talent acquisition journey that we're all on. Right? We used to be a back office function run like a cost center, to some degree logical, because we're part of the HR and people function, right? But, um, oh, sorry. But what is, what is the, uh, how do you say that? Um, I lost my text right here. That's happening for the first time ever. <laughs> sorry about that. So we're part of the people function, right? But if you run like a cost center, you cannot run talent acquisition like a cost center. You know why? Because if you optimize a cost center, you focus on making processes faster and cheaper. And having this laser focus on only becoming faster and cheaper has nothing to do with actually solving your talent challenges or actually preventing that you actually become the bottleneck. So what do you need to become that difference maker? That's the second part, right? You need a methodology or at least a structured approach. How can you actually continuously improve your talent acquisition capabilities? And after that, again, I want to show you how I started doing this in my previous organization. And what I want to share with you is the hiring success methodology. And this is what I use on a daily basis with all my customers I work with. And we share this for free, by the way, at hiringsuccess.com, everything I use. So you don't need to become a smart recruiter's customer. You don't need to buy a expensive consultancy package. You can just go there, download it, and start doing it yourself. And this is the high level overview of a continuous improvement model. Right, you have to start with evaluating your current state. Find a way to set your priorities, to identify what's broken or whatever is going on. And then second, you build a strategy. But please don't overcomplicate building a strategy. People are always so uh, complicated about it. A strategy is nothing more or less than a plan. What are you going to do and when are you going to do it? So a roadmap is an outcome of a good strategy. When you have that roadmap, you're actually going to execute that roadmap. So you're going to transform, you're going to do what you said you were going to do. And as last, you're going to evaluate how you are growing, right? So we want to optimize. So we're going to look at how we have evolved. And then that actually leads back into the first step, because now we're going to assess your new current state and the cycle begins again. And then this is the most condensed summary of the whole thing. I literally, again, use this at a daily basis. There is not a challenge that a customer can throw at me that I will not use this for. So I'll, I will walk you roughly through it, how it works. And I always start at the bottom, at the foundation. Because yes, we are a software company, but I'm a strategy consultant. So what I do, I take a look at the entire recruitment function over people, process, and technology. And I always start with the people piece. Who is responsible for what? and what is actually the behavior that we want to drive. And once we understand this and we all align on this, then we're gonna look, how do we design your processes? How do we configure your technology in such a way that we actually drive those behaviors? That is the rhythm I always go to for any challenge I have. And you actually look for the imbalances between these three. Uh, two organizations ago where I work, I get great people, great technology, but the process was broken. It took me five to seven business days to get an offer approved. We all know how painful that is, right? So Friday, end of the month, candidates coming out of their final interview on Monday and Tuesday, I already knew I can't make the offer. We lost candidates because of this at the end of every month. For some reason, we accepted it. I was a little, a little bit frustrated, as you can imagine. If you go up one layer, the pillars of hiring success, sounds amazing, right? But this is just your recruitment function, broken down into small little pieces, right? A talent attraction and engagement is everything top funnel. So you have your sourcing and CRM, 
job advertising, global and internal mobility, everything roughly up until the moment of application. Collaboration and selection is your mid funnel. So, uh, hey, we got 100 applicants. How do you get from the 100 applicants to the five that you want to interview? How do you actually interview? Based on what do you take hiring decisions? All the way to offer management and onboarding. So your mid funnel piece. And last, management and operating model. It's like the layer on top. So how are you organized as a TA team? How do you measure your own success? And how do you engage all your users for training throughout the year? Yes, we also need to do that, right? So all the work that you do, any problem that you want to solve always fits in this layer. Because again, this is your recruitment function. I'm currently working for a bank where I run three projects on reporting and analytics, offer management, and diversity and inclusion. So how do I make sure if I run three parallel projects with individual project teams, that whatever we design and come up with, that it actually makes our recruitment function better? That is where the principles come in. So these are actually my guidelines, if you will. So I always say it doesn't matter what you will ever work on, or what you design or decide or whatever, it doesn't matter. It should always positively impact one of these three, and definitely not negatively impact one of these three. So it should always improve the candidate experience and or, and it says engage hiring managers, but I like to say improve the collaboration between business and recruitment and or make the life of recruiters easier. Sounds like an open door, right? To some degree it is, but this is exactly where the friction arises. Right, I worked with a customer last summer and they wanted to start measuring the candidate experience to improve it, great, right? They came up with a process that actually required recruiters to manually send out these surveys at different parts of the journey. I'm like, what? That doesn't make the life of recruiters easier. That actually gives them more administrative tasks. So I said, no, that's not a good solution. Back to the drawing board. You need to find a different way. So the middle layer is all the types of projects that you can run. You try to balance out people, process, and technology, and the solution should always positively impact one of those three. If you're working on a project, you can't directly feel the link, how it positively impacts these three, you're probably not working on the right thing. And what happens if you every quarter, just choose one topic, or maybe two or three, every quarter you choose a new topic to work on, then we say you are on the road to achieve hiring success for your organization. And we actually define what that looks like with a North Star. And specifically, I want to put the emphasis on a North Star, right? This is not a goal that you will achieve in one quarter, or even in one year. A proper North Star is something that you keep aiming for. We are working with customers for years to get closer and closer to this goal. Because if we would go to your CEO today and we say, from today, hello CEO person, we will have the ability to attract, select and hire the best talent for any role on demand and on budget, always, no exceptions. That's a heavy promise to make, right? We have the best TA teams in the world that work with can probably make this promise for 70, 80% of the roles that they do. There are always exceptions. Again, this is why it is a North Star. So that is the structure I use for any challenge or problem a customer throws at me. I always use the same approach. So that's that methodology. So if we go back to that example, because maybe you think like, ah, oh, this, uh, this sounds great, but how do I actually start? Or maybe you say, well, it sounds great, but this is probably for very big corporate organizations that have dedicated project teams to run projects. Well, no. I currently work for organizations to up to almost half a million employees, but I also work for organizations that only have 400 employees. Truth be told, the 400 employees, it's actually easy to drive change because they take decisions a little bit faster, right? So it doesn't matter. It's more around what do you think STA leader is your responsibility? Again, that goes back to this image. Are you here to just fill the jobs, run your cost center, or is it your responsibility to actually solve the talent challenges for your organization? And if it is, it kind of is your responsibility to start doing this. And on how to start, the most important mantra I've learned in my career so far that actually helped me drive change within organizations is think big, start small. Think big, what is that ambition again? Right? What is that North Star? What are we aiming for? Very important. But actually what's more important, and that's the trick, start small. Start as small as possible. How can you start this week? So if we go back to that example, when I joined my previous organization, the situation was as follows, right? I came in there and they had all the ambitions, classic, right? They wanted to do CRM, they wanted to improve the hiring process, they wanted to do something with employer branding, they wanted to do everything. 
when I asked, why are we not doing this? Or what has actually stopped you from doing this today? They said, yeah, but look at this list of open jobs that we have. We're super busy recruiting. I don't have time to run some of these projects. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. So for me, the frustration was that it was a very old school team, right? Very manual, very slow, very operational, uh, and very reactive. And when I actually asked what the reason was why some of these processes existed that were manual, I literally got the answer multiple times. Yeah, we've done it like this for years. Excuse me? <laughs> for years? And in any business situation, if the answer to any process is we've done it always like this, the process is broken. You need to fix it, no exceptions. That cannot be the answer why we do something, right? But that was more my personal frustration. But the deeper pain was is that <coughs> candidates actually suffered from this poor and inconsistent experience. And again, with this organization as well, we lost candidates at the end of every month because of this. And for some reason it was acceptable. Oh yeah, we're not fast enough. Oh yeah, we can't get the second interview. Yeah, if they accept another offer, c'est ça. Then they maybe don't really want to work for us, those types of things. Like, whoa, that's kind of arrogant. We need to get our stuff together, <laughs> right? We need to be fast. So how do we actually solve that? Well, first, I failed a million times, but I will skip ahead uh, to, the one, to the version that actually worked for me and I'll share that with you. So what I started doing is Again, start small, right? I put a block in my calendar on every Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. It's at project work, no meetings. With two other colleagues, we, in these two hours, we would only work on continuous improvement projects. And let me tell you what we actually achieved in the first quarter. So in the first two meetings, two hours, two times, we only posted post-its on the wall with everything that was frustrating, that was broken, that we wanted to change, what ambitions that we had. It's anyway a very nice exercise to do, to get all that frustration out and put it on the wall. So it's anyway an interesting thing to do. But that, what did we do, that is what we did the first two weeks. The third week, we actually started to group these post-its together in logical teams. Right? What are all the things that we want to start improving? The fourth week, we chose one topic, and this one is important. Choose one topic that you truly believe that you can achieve in the remaining two months. Don't choose something that is super complex or the most frustrating or whatever it is. No, something you truly believe you can achieve. For us, that was the candidate experience and specifically the communication templates. And the communication templates because they were terrible. Different font sizes used, different fonts, different colors, different signatures, different logos. Even C people we hired, C level people we hired, made remarks about that, that we were so inconsistent. It's kind of frustrating. So what we did, so that was the that was the that was the topic we chose in the first month. So then we had two months left, right? The first two weeks, again, two, two times two hours, we just took an office. We mapped the entire candidate journey on three quarters of an office, and we literally started to print out every piece of communication we could potentially send to a candidate and post it on the wall at the right place of the journey. We invited somebody in for marketing and internal communication. They looked, they looked around. We literally did not have to say what, uh, uh, anything on what we wanted. They knew what had to be done. So now we had six weeks left. And in those six weeks, with the five of us, so the three of us plus those two other people, we rewrote all the email templates of the organization, of the recruitment department, obviously, right? Not the entire organization. I don't think we would have pulled it off in six weeks. But, and, and now we had email templates that were actually in our own language, how we actually speak to each other as colleagues with the same signatures, with the same logos. It was very consistent. And to be fair, yes, I had to order pizza twice. So two evenings, we ran a little bit over until 8, 9 p.m but we actually pulled it off in those six weeks. So what was the outcome? Two things actually happened. First, people had very visible evidence of the change that we brought. We took something that was frustrating on a daily basis and we improved it for them. So now uh, 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 what happened is that they started to come to us and start to ask, hey, can I join you on your Friday sessions? I wanna be part of this. And you as TA leader, you always say yes. Because what now happens, somebody wants to be part of something instead of you need to tell somebody what to do. The second thing that happened is actually what you did in the first few sessions, the first four to six hours. In four to six hours, you've given yourself three years worth of work. 
And now what happened is that you start to control the narrative because who's the one who posted all those post-its on the wall? Who is the one who actually grouped that in the logical teams that we actually want to start improving? That's you. And remember what I said, think big, have clarity on that North Star. Pick the one from Hiring Success. It's a perfect general one that works for every TA organization, right? Yeah, or get inspired and create your own one, but it's fine to take it because it's about the goal, never about the road how to get there because that's the joke, that doesn't matter. What you need to do is to consistently always have something that you're working on. If somebody literally walks into the project like, oh, this one, can I do this one? I'm super passionate about this one. I've done this in my previous organization, can I do it? And you as TA lady say, yes, please describe to me, and then we go back to that framework to see where you paid attention. How, did it, how does it improve the candidate experience? How does it improve the collaboration between business and recruitment? And how does it make the life of recruiters easier? And if we all agree on this motivation, sure, go do it. And this is how we started. And literally in under two years, about 20 months, we went from this very old school operational reactive TA team and we won a global award for the TA function that we have in under two years. So the key takeaways I have here, I think the main question is for you all is, TA people or people who, are, who work in our field. What is the scope of our role? Are you responsible to fill the open jobs or are you actually responsible to solve the talent challenges for your organization? And second, building a strong TA function is not a one-time project. It cannot be done. It is continuous improvement. And the last one, think big, but start as small as necessary just with a block of two hours on every Friday between three and five, no meetings, almost zero impact and it can change your life. So my question to you here today is, what is, you, what is stopping all of you from starting today? Thank you.